Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us again. Um, uh, another one of our Safer at Home series of talks. Um, I, I want to um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, if, um, as you as you probably know the rules by now, um, if you uh, if you would if you would mute your, yourself. Uh, if you want to leave your video on, you can. If you want to turn your video off, you you don't you, you don't have to, but you, you can. Um, these things are brought to us uh, by uh, Cape Cod Five, uh, by um, uh, First Citizens Federal Credit Union, and by Martha's Vineyard Savings. And we also want to thank um, Eight Cousins Bookseller because they always have um, copies of the books uh, here. Um, so we want to do that, and. Um, uh, so again, um, if you would mute yourself, if you've got a question, um, uh, make sure that uh, that you um, uh, answer it in the chat feature down below. Now we're going to do a little a, a little something different tonight. That I'm going to be the one in charge of um, uh, Dr. Taylor's PowerPoint. So he when he uh, when he says change screen, it's on me. So uh, 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 so if something goes awry, it's all my fault. Um, uh, our guest tonight, but and and also by the way, so if you got a question, use the chat feature down below. Uh, we'll take the questions at the end. I'll I'll read them for them. And um, also, if uh, if you're not a member, we'd love to have you as a member. We, we we welcome you to be a member of the Historical Society. And if anybody's got any suggestions for any of these virtual talks, because they seem to be pretty popular. Feel free to email me if there's a book or there's an author, there's a speaker you want to you want to um, see if they'll be willing to do this. Uh, all we got to do is ask, and we'll we'll see what comes of it. So, um, just a little FYI, um, our speaker tonight, uh, Alan Shaw Taylor, um, uh, originally from Maine, so he's he's familiar with us New Englanders, um, and he's a teacher at the University of Virginia. Um, he's also a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, he's got a book here that was, we're talking about, about Thomas Jefferson and, and Jefferson education. Would you welcome Alan Shaw Taylor? Thank you very much. Uh, and, and thank you, Mark, for that introduction and for your helping to arrange this. So I, I am going to speak about a book that I recently published. It's called Thomas Jefferson's Education. And it's in part about the education that Thomas Jefferson received growing up in late colonial Virginia during the 1760s. Uh, but it's primarily about the kind of education that Jefferson thought was necessary in the new republic that took shape after the American Revolution, and especially in Virginia. And Virginia was the largest state in the Union, it had the largest population, it was the wealthiest state. It produced um, a disproportionate number of the leaders of the United States, including its presidents. And so Virginia really set the pace for many things in the early Republic. For Jefferson, Jefferson thought of himself, uh, as did most Virginians, first and foremost, as a Virginian rather than an American. And he thought of the United States as a useful confederation that could um, project Virginia's power throughout the continent. But as we'll see, this started to change in the early 19th century. And that change is very traumatic for leading Virginians, including Thomas Jefferson. And it was the set of changes that led to the creation of the University of Virginia which opened its doors in 1825. And it's not the first public university in the country. Uh, it had predecessors in other southern states, in Georgia and South Carolina and North Carolina. And so Virginia is coming to the game a little bit late. But it's interesting that the very earliest public universities in this country emerged in the South rather than the North. But they emerged in the South very much because Southerners had their eyes on the North and they were becoming nervous. Now, Virginia's legislature authorized a new state legislature in the late 18 teens. And this was unprecedented because Virginians had not been in the business of spending public money on any form of education. There was no K-12 educational system. There were only private schools and uh, most Virginians didn't go to them. 
there was only one significant college, that was the College of William and Mary, and it ordinarily had less than 120 students. So education was not a priority for Virginians, and that suddenly changes in the late 18 teens. And the state would authorize buildings that cost 294,000, which doesn't seem like much today, but that was a fortune for Virginia public allocation at that time. So why do they do this? And they're also doing it during a, during a severe economic depression, the panic of 1819. And this depression persisted uh, deep into the 1820s, the very period in which they're creating the University of Virginia. And it compounded a pervasive sense of gloom uh, in Virginia that they were slipping in every way, economically, in terms of population, and in terms of leaders and clout in the union, the union of the states. And they noticed with great alarm the census returns from 1810 and then from 1820 that showed that Virginia was no longer the largest and most populous state. It was slipping behind New York and Pennsylvania. It was evident that the northern states were growing more rapidly and that their economies were more vibrant than Virginia, which was very dependent upon plantation agriculture and export markets. Now this demographic and economic um, decline cost Virginia clout in Congress. And this was manifest then in a political crisis of 1819 to 1820, when Northern congressmen were trying to block the admission of Missouri as a new state, unless Missouri committed to a program of gradual emancipation. Northern congressmen were arguing that for a true republic, you needed to be free of slavery. Now, it didn't happen, have to happen overnight or even soon, but over the course of a generation, they wanted Missourians to commit to emancipating their slaves and to barring uh, the introduction of any new slaves from outside. And, but this set off alarm bells in the South, uh, where they thought this was unfair to ask this of Missouri, and that it was a power play by Northern states that were trying to ham in and stop the South from expanding westward. And so Virginians thought that the union of the states was really no longer serving their interests. Uh, they weren't ready to secede from the Union quite yet, but they thought that this had become a very contentious Union, and one in which Virginians had to aggressively defend their own interests, including the expansion westward of slavery, which was especially important to them at this time of economic depression, because one of the ways that Virginians paid their debts was to sell slaves to the new uh, farmers and planters in the West, in places like Kentucky and Arkansas and Missouri. And so Virginians didn't have a sense of themselves as Americans so much as that Virginia was their own country. And the leading newspaper in Virginia, the Richmond Inquirer, declared in 1821, quote, the internal policy of Massachusetts or Connecticut is as widely different from that of Virginia or South Carolina as that of England is from that of Russia. So there is a sense in the South that this is not a unified nation, but that this is still a confederation of states and states that are very different and with clashing interests. And so Virginians, they saw the solution to their problem of the late 18 teens and early 1820s is to train better leaders who could argue Virginia's case in Congress and who could defend Virginia against perceived cultural and political and economic aggression by Northern interests. And one of the leading thinkers of this is Thomas Jefferson. He said, without improving the education of Virginia's leaders, Virginians would he warned, lacked the cultural strength to face the 
sectional crisis, quote, which is to burst on us as a tornado sooner or later. So Jefferson's an, an early prophet of the coming of the Civil War. And he said the best defense was to build a first-rate university, quote, worthy of the station of our state in the scale of the nations of the world. So for him, Virginia is a nation, just as Massachusetts was a nation, and New York was a nation. And the union for him is something like the United Nations. And that he saw it increasingly as a contentious place where Northerners did not have the best interests of Virginians at heart. Now, if I could have the next image, please. Mark, I have the next slide? Thank you. So th this is a, a map of Virginia, and I just want to call your attention to pretty much in the center of the state, you see Albemarle County, and at the center of Albemarle County, you see Charlottesville, and uh, very near Charlottesville is Monticello, which was Jefferson's home. So when Jefferson is pushing for a new university, he wants it to be in Charlottesville, and he will ultimately get his way. If I could have the next image, please. Now, Virginia did have a college. It had the College of William and Mary, and that's where Thomas Jefferson had gone to college. So there was this perception that the leaders of the revolution in Virginia had largely been trained at William and Mary, and William and Mary had done a good job. But there was a perception by the 18 teens that William and Mary was failing, that it was located in Williamsburg, which was in the Tidewater region, which was economically declining, while the Piedmont region of the interior, including Albemarle County, that was the region that was more economically dynamic uh, in where uh, wheat cultivation was as important as tobacco. But tobacco was in decline in Virginia, Tidewater was in decline, and Williamsburg in particular was in decline because it's no longer the capital of the state. It had been relocated to Richmond on the margin of the Piedmont. And so William and Mary is perceived by people of the Piedmont as being a very unhealthy place, prone to malaria, as having a mediocre faculty, and having young men that were prone to drinking, swearing, and conducting riots. And they included this young man, uh, you see here in posture, William Somerville, who got kicked out for engaging in a duel. And the students of William and Mary insisted that they had every right to duel with one another to defend their honor. And so the perception in Virginia was that William and Mary was failing. And therefore, Virginia's parents were sending in a growing number of their students to northern institutions, especially Harvard, Yale, and above all, to Princeton. And this started to worry them during the 18-teens when anti-slavery sentiment is becoming more public in northern states, and especially at these northern universities. Jefferson warned that 500 young Virginians were studying in the North and, quote, imbibing opinions and principles in discord with those of their own country. The cancer is eating on the vitals of our existence. So Virginia, the country is, I mean, excuse me, for Jefferson, the country's Virginia. And he feels it's threatened by young Virginians going away to college in the North. And it's to stop that brain drain that Jefferson and other leading Virginians push for a new university, something that could supplant the College of William and Mary in educating the leaders of Virginia. But this is the problem. If a university is designed to defend the South by training its young men to be effective politicians at the national level, it's meant to defend the Southern way of life. But the Southern way of life bred young men in the planter class who were very reluctant to be educated. They were bred with a powerful sense of honor, such as William Somerville had. They are bred to be very prickly about any insult and to perceive insult in any slight and to refuse to accept anyone exercising authority over them. 
They are being trained to be the future leaders of their state and to be the managers of their own plantations. And their sense of honor was defined as at the polar extreme from the dishonor of slavery. So they said that slaves had to accept any insult, they had to take orders from others, and that a true master took orders from no one and accepted no insult from anyone. Now, these young men going to away to college, and I use young men loosely because people went to college at a younger age. They're going when they're 14, 15, 16 years old. They are full of themselves. They are away from home for an extended period for the first time, and they are thrown in together with one another. And as you can imagine, this is the most defiant, difficult population uh, for professors to try to teach. If I could have the next image, please. Now, a North Carolina student thought that his peers were the most dissipated, profane, and defiant in the land. His father partially disagreed. He said, quote, the dissipation you speak of pervades all the states where slavery abounds. Were you conversant with the habits of South Carolina or Georgia University, you would find darker traces there than at Chapel Hill. Indeed, at South Carolina College, the students staged black rides, where they blackened their faces, stole the horses of faculty, and galloped about the campus while waving flaming torches till they exhausted the horses and then they jumped off and went and hid in the ranks of their fellow cheering students. All of this was done to provoke the faculty and show that the true power at South Carolina College was held by the students. Now the man who was the president of South Carolina College is Thomas Cooper and you see him here. And Thomas Cooper had formerly taught at a Pennsylvania college. So he's familiar with Northern students and he's become familiar with Southern students. Colleges in the early Republic of the United States, meaning the period between the revolution and approximately 1830. Colleges were everywhere, North and South, pretty turbulent places where students were pretty quick to riot if they didn't like something. But they were especially turbulent where Southern students were most numerous. So for example, the most troubled Northern university was Princeton. And it's not coincidence that Princeton had the highest proportion of Southern students of any Northern institution. A third of Princeton students came from the South. And this turbulence was even greater, as Thomas Cooper knew, at Southern institutions, such as the University of North Carolina, University of South Carolina and the University of Georgia. And Thomas Cooper set out to explain this to his friend Thomas Jefferson in the letter. And he said that what was to blame was that Southern parents of the planter class indulged their sons, trained them to be um, assertive, defiant, unwilling to accept anyone else's authority. Quote, in my opinion, the parental indulgence to the South renders young men less fit for college government than the habits of the Northern people. And the rigid discipline of the Northern University must be put in force in the South. So this then is the great problem that Jefferson is facing when he founds the University of Virginia. How can he create a university designed to train an elite to defend the Southern way of life, when that Southern way of life bred young men who were very reluctant or indeed defiant about accepting the authority of professors. They tended to think of professors as not real gentlemen, that they dressed shabbily, uh, they didn't have as much money as the sons of the planter class, and they spent too much time with books. And Southern students really didn't go to Southern universities to spend that much time with their books. 
They primarily went there to spend time with one another, which meant gambling at cards, drinking heavily, and then um, feeling that someone had insulted them and end up fighting with one another and waging duels. And this is then to the despair of somebody like Thomas Cooper, and it was of great concern to Thomas Jefferson. Can I have the next slide, please? This is Thomas Jefferson in the, in the famous Thomas Sully painting, which was done about 1820. So this is what Thomas Jefferson looked at the time when he's founding the University of Virginia. And he wrote back to Cooper and he said, you know, the greatest difficulty that I face in creating this new university, and I've got all, lots of difficulties with state legislators who don't want to give me the money I need for the buildings, but my biggest problem is the potential students. He said, quote, the article of discipline is the most difficult in American education. Premature ideas of independence, too little repressed by parents, beget a spirit of insubordination, which is the great obstacle to science with us and a principal cause of its decay since the revolution. Can I have the next slide, please? So here is that quote. Now, I just, I just wanna focus in on this. Uh, one thing to notice is what he means by science. In the early 19th century, science was well, a broader category than it is for us today. It included any inquiry that was disciplined and rational and empirical. So for Jefferson, there was a science of the law. There was a science of history. There was a science of politics. Uh, what science meant for him was the opposite of tradition. So science is about knowledge being progressive through inquiry, through testing, whether that's testing in the law or that's testing in a laboratory. Now, it's un striking that Jefferson would talk about premature ideas of independence. After all, this is the guy who wrote the Declaration of Independence. And to see him say that uh, intellectual inquiry has, had decayed since the revolution is contrary to our sense of Jefferson as a sunny optimist about human potential. And somebody who was very invested in the American Revolution. So, but he has a sense that things have, have gone wrong and they've gone wrong because young men and education in his mind was reserved uh, almost exclusively for young white men. But something had gone wrong and he had to set up to fix it or UVA would fail. And he's got a program. He is a man of the enlightenment and he believes that if you have the right combination of buildings, of landscape, of pools, and of rooms, that young people's behavior on. will take a new shape. And so he set out to apply his ideas at UVA to change Southern young men so that they would become more effective defenders of the Southern way of life. And the next image, please. Now, this was a challenge for Jefferson in part because he had spent his own youth at William and Mary engaging in riots. He said he recalled the regular annual riots and battles between the students of William and Mary and the town people before the revolution. And then the Latin phrase, quorum pars fui, which says, of which I was a part. So he understands the appeal of turbulence to people in their teens and uh, he's got to do something to change what he sees as human nature. Next image, please. Now, this is the so-called Wren Building, uh, which was the primary building at the College of William and Mary when Jefferson went there, and it's one big building, and that was standard at uh, American colleges and universities in the, in the colonial period and in the early 19th century. And Jefferson said, this is where things go wrong. You, you're, you're piling all these um, late adolescents together. Uh, they can plot and make trouble. What we need to do is disperse them. So he says, uh, big building is big trouble. And I'm gonna come up with an alternative at, at the University of Virginia, which he designed. Okay, the next image, please. 
And this shows an overview of what the University of Virginia looked like as a map at that time. You see at the head of it is the rotunda. You'll also note there is no chapel. That was important to, to Jefferson, who, who did not want um, organized religion at UVA. And then you see two parallel rows uh, extending uh, eastward from the rotunda. Uh, and they're called pavilions strung along the way. And in between the pavilions, there were the dorm rooms for students. The pavilions were reserved for professors, one per professor. And so you can see that there are 10 of them. So he, he expected to have 10 professors. And the, professor and, the, and, and the professor's family, and all professors were men, uh, they would live in the pavilion upstairs, and then the lower floor would serve as classrooms. And they would uh, disperse the students between the faculty houses. And for Jefferson, this was going to introduce greater order. The students would be more dispersed among them one another, and they would have faculty members living amongst one another. And he said, quote, it would afford that quiet retirement so friendly to study and lessen the dangers of fire, infection, and tumult. Every professor would be the police officer of the students adjacent to his own pavilion. Now you see also two other rows that are in the rear of the pavilions and they have structures called hotels. The hotels were for the students. They weren't places for them to sleep, but they were places where they would receive their meals. And between the hotels, you also have other dorm rooms. There was a capacity, there were 108 dorm rooms, two students per room. There was a capacity of 216 students, which Jefferson hoped to attract in the first years of the university. If I can have the next image, please. He also thought that if he recruited faculty from Britain, such as this man, Robley Dunlinson, who was the first medical professor at UVA, and at UVA, um, medicine was an undergraduate uh, item of study, that if he recruited these faculty from Britain, uh, that they would have a kind of cachet, a prestige that would um, command greater respect from Virginia students. And so that's a second part of his plan, along with dispersing the students and interspersing faculty pavilions among them. And then the next key element of his plan was that he wanted to create something called a board of censors, which the students would staff. And so if, if students acted out in a big way, so if they hit a professor or they uh, broke windows, then something like that would uh, the faculty would have to decide the punishment. But Jefferson thought that students would be more orderly if the minor problems, such as defacing a library book, that the, the student body of censors, chosen by the faculty, however, out of the student body, that uh, the students would be more inclined to be more orderly. But there was a problem that, that students uh, were opposed to any student informing on any other student. And so they regarded the board of censors as inviting them to tattle on each other. And so no student would agree to serve on Jefferson's board of censors. I can have the next slide, please. And this is what the, the lawn at UVA, you see the, the rotunda there at the head and you can see the, the faculty pavilions with the, the student dorms in between them. If I could have the next, please. In July of 1825, the, the, the doors to the university opened in March. And in July, Jefferson is ready to pronounce the, his experiment as a great success. That he has every reason to be satisfied with the government of the institution and that the students were not idle, they weren't turbulent that uh, observers had never known a more orderly collection of young men. Jefferson soon had reason to regret this assessment because student behavior gets worse and worse as the months go on. Later that summer, one student said of his peers, quote, instead of attending to their books, they are sauntering about from one day's end to another in all kinds of rascality and mischief, end quote. I can have the next image, please. And 
troubles get worse in September, uh, and the rioters become more confrontational with the faculty. They, they go out on the lawn at night uh, and make as much noise as they can. They're wearing masks. They have uh, musical instruments that they don't know how to play, but they, so they play them as badly as they can to make as much noise as they can. And they scream and they hoot and they holler and they say things like, down with the European professors, or damn the European professors. And in one case, they uh, hurled a bottle of urine through the window, smashing the window in one of the faculty pavilions. And this elicited comment from Jefferson's daughter, who you see here, Martha Jefferson Randolph, who said um, that the chief culprit was, quote, a rich fool who cursed, quote, the European professors. Now, the crescendo came uh, on October 1st, 1825. The students are, are rioting again on the lawn. Uh, they are doing their best to wake up the professors, to irritate the professors, to show that the students have the real power at the school and not the professors. There is no president at UVA at that time. The faculty collectively provide the governing body of the institution, subject to the occasional oversight of something called the Board of Visitors, of which Jefferson was the leading member. These rioting students are carrying on insulting, damning the professors. Uh, two foolish professors came out to uh, accost them and they got roughed up, uh, badly beaten. Could I have the next image, please? And that riot happened right here in front of uh, pavilion number nine, um, which uh, one of the professors who came out to confront the students lived in that pavilion. And he got uh, very tired of the students um, carrying on the way they did. Uh, but they, he then had to flee as the students hurled sticks, bottles, and a brick at him. This caused a crisis at the university. Uh, and the Board of Visitors gets involved. And Jefferson has to confront the failure of his measures to try to quickly convert Virginia students into the kind of studious students that he had been most of the time at William and Mary. So what had gone wrong? Well, instead of taming students, Jefferson's measures made things worse. Let me start out first with the arranging of the pavilions among the students and dispersing the students. This, this doesn't um, increase faculty control. Instead, it increases student control over the faculty, that they are in a position to harass the faculty in order to show who was boss at the university. So that backfired. Bringing in European professors didn't work out because they, in fact, didn't command respect from young Virginians who judged people on the basis of their clothing and thought these professors were too studious and dressed poorly and were not proper gentlemen of the Virginia sort. And so they didn't really respect them. And then there's the Board of Censors, which the students really didn't like, didn't want any part of, because it was an invitation to them to inform on one another, which they considered to be the most disgraceful, dishonorable thing that you could do. And then finally, there was one uh, innovation that Jefferson introduced, which was to abolish the summer vacation. Well, you can imagine abolishing a summer vacation would not go over well in New England, but imagine in Virginia with these students. And this is long before air conditioning. And these students don't want to be cooped up inside college buildings. They want to be off with their friends who would go off to the mountain spas in, in what is now West Virginia uh, to, for a social scene that was very vibrant and much more pleasant than being cooped up at the University of Virginia. But Jefferson felt that the university had gotten off to a late start in March and the students had to play catch up. And so they had to be cooped up and he refused to receive their petitions asking for even the briefest of summer vacations. Now Jefferson wanted to score points against William and Mary as well, which he regarded as a malarial hellhole in summer. And he wanted to make the point that Charlottesville was the healthiest and happiest place on earth. 
but the summer of 1825 was one of the hottest on record up until that time. And so the students were truly miserable and they decided to take it out on the people they could take it out on, which were the faculty and not Jefferson, who was safely up on his mountaintop at Monticello. And so Jefferson's rules had failed to shake the defiant solidarity of Virginia students. On the contrary, he had made things worse and he'd reap the consequences. And he would die uh, a few months later, in uh, famously July 4th, 1826, with the university no more orderly uh, than it had started out as. And so uh, Virginia would, uh, the University of Virginia would continue to remain a turbulent place in which the culture of Southern students had trumped the enlightenment design of Thomas Jefferson and so it would remain uh, until we get to the 1840s and 1850s, which is when a more orderly student culture is belatedly introduced to Thomas Jefferson's university. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and I'll be happy to, I will just skip on past this, I'll be happy to take on um, and address any questions that you may have. Thank you so much for that. That was that was excellent. If you got any questions, remember to use the chat feature down below. Um, as you're talking about this, you know, you, you, you're saying that uh, the Virginia students were generally 14, 15. How long does that age last? And if, it, if they become a more orderly student in the 1840s, 1850s, did the, did the median age range go up as well? Or, or what what prompted a more civil student? Right. Uh, in, when Jefferson dies, uh, the leadership of the university and the board of visitors uh, evolves uh, toward people who are less secular than Jefferson was. And they start to encourage religion, Christian religion, Protestant Christian religion uh, among the students. And there is a cultural change going on in Virginia in the 1830s and 1840s in which the elite families are embracing evangelical Christianity in a big way for the first time. They'd always in the past uh, regarded evangelical Christianity as, as something for poorer whites and poorly educated people. Uh, and they thought of themselves as above that. But they, they changed their mind in the, the 1830s and 1840s. And so you get a student population that comes to UVA that is, is prepared to be a bit more orderly and to accept the authority of others in a new way. And it's also true that uh, the number of students expands and there are going to be larger numbers of students who are 18, 19, 20 years old. And in the 1840s, you get the very first um, scholarships. So in Jefferson's day, there's no money for scholarships. He spent all the money on buildings. And so UVA was a very expensive place to go. It was the most expensive college or university in the country, which meant that only young men from this planter class, which is the most disorderly class in Virginia, only those young men could go to UVA in the 1820s and early 1830s. And that changes over time. He, Jefferson always seemed to regard the founding of the University of Virginia as one of his crowning achievements, and yet it sounds like this was a rather turbulent start. Um, did he, uh, was he whistling past the graveyard here? Was he just trying to uh, see the, the, the happy things, or was, was it really, uh, was he really as proud of it as, a, as he could have been or should have been? He was very proud of UVA um, and he would every Sunday he would bring a group of students up to Monticello and he would host them for dinner and this was in rotation so that all the students would go up there. Well the students are on their best behavior when they're at Monticello. Um, they're not on their best behavior when they're back down at, at UVA. Also Jefferson's an elderly man and he feels that um, this is his last great accomplishment creating UVA. And he desperately wants it to succeed. So he has a great capacity to overlook 
facts that contradict his hopes and a great capacity to pick out strands of fact that seem to confirm his hopes. And so he would continue to write that, well, we, we had this trouble in September and October of 1825, but we resolved it all. But if you go and you read the letters of the faculty or the disciplinary records of the school, or you read the letters from the students from early 1826, especially the letters of this young man named Edgar Allan Poe, uh, who uh, will get, uh, have to leave because of $2,000 of gambling debts. If you read all of that information, it's very evident that um, UVA remains a very turbulent place, contrary to what Jefferson is telling people. You mentioned at the top that the, um, the Northern colleges were considered more Orderly, you know that the the uh, the rigid discipline of New England states, the northern states, seem to come in. That what is that? Was that a true assessment? Would that is that would if you juxtapose a Harvard, a Yale, a, a, even a Princeton versus a William and Mary of Virginia, is that assessment correct at this time? Yeah, th there's abundant evidence. Almost everybody who visits the South or the North and looks at colleges and universities says it's, it's a different culture, it's a different educational culture in the North. Um, that there's a, um, there's a greater commitment to education, uh, that uh, discipline is a big part of education, that, um, and that there are also more scholarships. And there are scholarship students who, and they are expected to do things like serve meals, clean up after meals, cook meals for their other students. You could never ask a the son of a Virginia planter to do that for other students. It would be dishonoring. So, but that's accepted in the North. And so everybody thought that Northerners um, were more disciplined, harder working, diligent. Uh, they also thought that they were penny pinching and, and stingy and um, not a lot of fun to be around compared to Virginians who were the life of the party. So there were very well-formed stereotypes of the Virginian and the New Englander. And there's a lot of evidence that there were uh, more than germs of truth to these stereotypes. Did Jefferson use any of his friends and colleagues as professors? No, because uh, Virginians didn't want to be college professors, at least and not those of the planter class, who was the people that Jefferson hung out with. Jefferson may have believed in democracy, but uh, he, he believed in socializing with his own class. Uh, and so the, the people who helped him found the university, people like uh, Joseph Cabell and, and John Hartwell Cock, they're other great planters, and uh, they don't want to be professors. Now, now, Cabell had been invited to be a professor at the College of William and Mary, uh, and Cabell was a, an intellectually very serious man. Uh, but he decided it would be too dishonorable for him to actually be a professor. So if you can't get Virginians to do it, you're either going to have to go to New England to get professors, or you're going to have to go to Britain. And given that choice, Jefferson said, I'm going to Britain. Uh, students, even though his rules were meant to make students in, in more like Yankees. That's a reference. New Englanders, not to the baseball team, we all. Okay. Um, remind us then, why were the university students so young? Why was it that 14 and 15 year olds versus 18 and 19 year olds? There's nothing else going on. There's very little in the way of what we would call high school education. They would go to an academy when they were 10, 11, 12 years old, learn a little bit of something, and then what are they going to do? And then, so they're sent off to college at age 13, 14, 15. Um, question here. Um, with due respect, with the idea Jefferson wished to create a plantation education for these young men to perpetuate the, the, the institute of slavery, should UVA distance itself from him? 
Well, Jefferson is famously a very complicated guy. He wrote often, well, several times he wrote that slavery was a great evil system, and he wished Virginia would get rid of that system. He, but he came up with an utterly impractical so-called solution. He said that the emancipation had to be gradual over three generations. It had to be compensated. The masters had to be paid for their lost human property, which would be enormously expensive. And then he insisted that all the freed slaves would have to be shipped out of Virginia, not to somewhere else in the United States, but overseas, back to Africa, which would also add enormously to the cost. And Virginians were not in the business of taxing themselves to do anything. So, but Jefferson and other leading Virginians all clung to this fantasy that was called colonization. Uh, because they refused to see the possibility, indeed the only solution to slavery, is that emancipated people would remain as your neighbors and should be treated as your equal citizens. That's the only solution to ending slavery. But they refused to accept that. So while Jefferson was anti-slavery, he had plenty of prejudices against black people. Now, that's not unique to Jefferson. That, he has the views of his entire planter class. And, and frankly, the views of, of common white men in Virginia who, who didn't own slaves. It's, this is a pervasive, they just, they're in an echo chamber where they hear themselves all say, we hate slavery, but we can't get rid of slavery because it's not safe for us to do so uh, unless we can ship them all away. And then, um, but we can't afford that. So here we are, we're stuck with slavery and we, we know it's evil. But we're stuck with it. That, that was the, the core conviction of Virginians. They said it early off the newspaper, books, pamphlets, house speeches everywhere. It's just, it's repeated all the time. You couldn't find Virginians, or you could find very few Virginians, mostly some Quakers, who would say, wait a minute, we have, we have to provide education and we have to provide economic opportunity. We have to treat them as citizens and free them. Uh, and then of course, African-Americans all wanna be free and they want education, they want equality, uh, but they're being silenced. Now, um, so the question is, you know, what, what do we do now um, in the present, uh, now that uh, slavery by and large is in the past? Uh, but equality is is not not achieved yet. What do we do with with Jefferson and the other founders of UVA? Um, and there there are a variety of views on that. Um, I am inclined to keep Jefferson uh, on view in in statues and so forth as a reminder that of how flawed the founding of the University of Virginia was and how tainted by slavery everything in Virginia was. This, this is not just you know, some compartment of life. This affects, and this is what the point of the book was, it affects everything. It affects education, it affects politics, it affects the law, it affects how people socialize with one another. It's a total system which is what makes it such a powerful and such an evil system that people who we could otherwise admire like Thomas Jefferson end up being complicit in a system which they know fundamentally is morally wrong, but which they cannot free themselves from. Do you feel education was a key to ending slavery? Was that, was that, was that a way out? Well, it's a, it's in a way, it's a, it's a way out for Jefferson. He, um, he some young men in Virginia, some, uh, particularly, 
um, idealistic young men, they're, they're few and far between, but there are some, say, you know, we read the Declaration of Independence. It says all men are created equal. Okay, well, how about you help us lead a crusade against slavery here in Virginia? Jefferson would say, you know, that's a noble cause, but I'm too old. And he starts saying this when he's in his 40s. And he continues it saying it when these young men over the years would, would come to him and say, you know, we, we read your anti-slavery writings from the 1780s about helping us organize politically. And Jefferson says, no, it's, it's kind of hopeless right now. All, all, the, all the people of my generation, they won't consider any kind of change. So, but it's up to you people, but you're going to have to do it on your own. So what Jefferson says about UVA is that if we just improve the quality of education of the leaders in Virginia, again, he's much more concerned about the leaders of Virginia, their education, than about common education. He doesn't want common people to be educated. His number one concern is that the people who will lead Virginia, which he assumes will continue to come from the richest class, that those men be better educated in what he called science. And he assumed that they then would become anti-slavery, not that they would be indoctrinated in anti-slavery ideas, because he doesn't want that at UVA, but he just thinks that they're, they're generally well-educated about biology, natural history, law, medicine, the Greek and Latin classic. If they're broadly educated, that they will naturally see that slavery is wrong and they as the political leaders will do something about it. So he's kicking the can down the road and UVA is his kick. You guys, I'm creating UVA, I'm still true to my anti-slavery principles and UVA is going to be the vehicle that in a generation or two will free Virginia of slavery. Well, it doesn't work. What, what UVA ends up doing is training the young men who will lead the Confederacy in resisting uh, any change to the Southern way of life, in, including the system of slavery. Was college education a four-year program at that time, and were any of the students ever expelled for misconduct of that early, those early classes? Yeah, students, students are expelled. You, you have to do some pretty serious stuff. So one of the ringleader of the riot on October 1st uh, gets kicked out. Turns out it was Thomas Jefferson's grandnephew. Um, so that was embarrassing. Uh, so occasionally students get kicked out. Um, ordinarily because they're repeat offenders. Uh, but college is not a four-year cycle. It's not, it's not as defined as it has come. And almost nobody graduates from UVA, just as almost nobody graduated from the University of North Carolina or the College of William & Mary. These young men would go, on average, for a little over one year. Uh, and so they go, they party with one another, they attend a few classes, they make some connections, and then they go home. Uh, and indeed, it was a point of pride that, among these young men to say, you know, if, if you get a degree, that just proves what a grind you are, that you're kind of like a Yankee. Uh, so uh, very few people graduated from, um, from UVA um, in these early years, and, and the average attendance was just a little over a year. So there's a very rapid turnover of students there. Uh, and, and an example is Edgar Allan Poe, who was there just for a year. Did Jefferson put what's now Washington and Lee in the same category as William and Mary? Well, he, in, yes and no. Uh, uh, Washington and Lee was a Presbyterian school, uh, so it had a very strong religious identity at that time. And Jefferson doesn't like uh, for colleges or universities to have religious identities. And he especially didn't like Presbyterians. Uh, he had very powerful prejudices against them. And uh, so he saw Washington and Lee as, as in fact, a rival because Washington and Lee pre-existed um, the University of Virginia. And they had actually proposed to the legislature, why don't you make us the university? We're already up and running. And we're really kind of in the center of the state too. Uh, and we got this very wealthy donor who will give a ton of money. 
Well, Jefferson basically gets himself put in charge of the commission that will make the decision and through some sleight of hand decides that the contribution of this donor really isn't that significant and therefore the university will go to Charlottesville. I want to thank you for the time tonight. This has been excellent. Um, uh, I wish you great good luck with this book. Is it is it as you're writing this and you're talking about the Yankees and and the time of the Virginia? Is it uh, do you have to go back to your main roots a little bit and say that uh, now I'm down in Virginia and how how this is uh, <laughs> how do you view this as as somebody that was born and raised outside of Virginia talking about Virginians? Well, it's. <sighs> Uh, I've, I've been in Virginia for a number of years now. I've been here for six years. And before that, I went had a postdoc at the, at the College of William & Mary. So I know William & Mary and UVA both pretty well. Uh, and I like Virginia. Uh, I, you know, I don't like everything about Virginia, but I don't like everything about New England either. So, uh, But it, it gives me something of an outsider's perspective. And I think that's valuable, but it's also important to bear in mind that the University of Virginia is not really a Southern institution, I would say. Uh, the faculty are overwhelmingly from elsewhere rather than from Virginia. They're from Northern states uh, or they're from Asia or Europe or Africa. The students are overwhelmingly from Northern Virginia, which means they come from the suburbs of Washington, D.C., which uh, tend to be liberal suburbs. Uh, and so indeed, the, the students who happen to come from rural Virginia who go to UVA often feel that they're, they're fish out of water at UVA. So Charlottesville is kind of an oasis um, in a state which is actually trending blue in recent years. So uh, I think sometimes people outside of Virginia perceive Virginia as, as still the, the Virginia and the UVA of the 1950s, and things have changed quite a bit, largely because of the growth of the suburbs around Washington, D.C. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us tonight. I wish you great good luck with this book. Uh, it's been a real honor to have you with us. And uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Stay safe. And um, our next lecture is a week from Thursday. Uh, stay safe, everyone. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you very much.